Good morning, Life Church. Still, is it still cold outside? Yeah. When you get here early, you, you just kind of hope things change, but sometimes you just don't. This is that week, though, isn't it? Where whether you're ready or not, here it comes. We'll be together Friday night. South Reno Baptist will be our celebration. Hope you can be there. Linda and I hope to go down to Yarrington on Saturday, a church there that I pastored some pastoral role for 34 years. Some people know when to quit and some people don't. <laughs> My brother's been pastoring down there for the last 10 years and he's retiring and that'll be his last official service will be Christmas Eve. But maybe even bigger than that, well, that will be the end of 50 years at that church where there's always been a Chisholm as the senior pastor. Yeah. Are you clapping because it's not going to be like that anymore or what? Yeah. Finally, the regime has ended. Yeah. But big day. But one of the cool things we're looking forward to going down is I have a couple of new grandnephews I've never met and a, and a little grandniece that I've only seen once that are going to be there uh, at my sister's for, for Christmas. And I'm anxious to meet that there's, there's a, a, one of his name is Zephyr. I liked it. And Sawyer, those are the two little boys. And the little girl is Bodie Jean. Yeah. I was, anyway. <laughs> but I'm anxious to meet them. And uh, see, because there just ought to be some babies around at Christmas. It just seems like that's the way it ought to work, you know. And um, I'm desperate. These are grand nephews and nieces, but I'll take it, you know. It's the best we can do at the moment. It's just there ought to be babies. Is there something about the season? And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that, about this birth announcement. Uh, Ray touched on it last week. He said this announcement that came from the angels was some of the best and purest theology in the Bible. Just like wise Pastor Tom said, some of the great theology in the, uh, in the Christmas carols, good words laying down. So just some wonderful stuff, you know, that, that God was wanting to make sure this point where this news was too big. It, it was just a size that heaven kind of ripped wide open. And all the rejoicing that was going on in heaven spilled over into into earth, into our atmosphere. And there's a celebration, there's a huge celebration. And what the angels said was huge. It, it wasn't just celebratory like most of our, our baby announcements are. In fact, I have a few baby announcements I found that I thought were interesting. This is, first one is the best use of one of those, hello, my name is, <laughs> cards I have ever seen. My name is Tess. That's great. Uh, this one, the next one, is not really a baby, it's more of a pregnancy announcement, but <laughs> takes a second. Ice, ice, baby, yeah, okay, all right. Let's keep rolling. I like this one. I lost 10 pounds in one hour and 40 minutes. Ask me how. It's uh, pretty good. This is my favorite. Band of brothers. That looks like a tough little kid. Band of Brothers, introducing Paul Alistair, Charles Laurent, based on a true story. That's good. And this next one, I don't know what the parents were thinking. <clears throat> it's like, let's hope it's celebratory and not predictive, all right? This is hope. And the last one is my favorite. Uh, let's, un let's unpack it. He's wide-eyed and wondering, what in the world am I doing in packing peanuts? This, is, yeah. this was a baby announcement. But this is a baby announcement for all times. And I want to read it. Ray read this scripture last week, but I want to read it again. Let's turn to Luke 2 and chapter, or excuse me, chapter 2 and verse 8. Yeah. Hey, almost as loud as the original announcement. And in the same region... There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, 
For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I could stop right there because my sermon, that's where my sermon's coming from. But I, want, I like the rest of this, so you're going to listen. <laughs> this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. We're going to do a little bit of that. We're going to go take a look at what God was announcing and what the angels were really saying to us and saying to the, to the world and anybody else that would listen. This, this birth announcement was predictive. This was a moment in time when Israel, um, at, at the point when Jesus was born, Israel was really not in the greatest of condition. They did not confuse luxuries with necessities like we do here in America. They were occupied. They were an occupied country. They were under the economic, political, and psychological heel of Rome. Uh, and and they were still hanging on to these ancient promises that Yahweh had made back to their ancestors that one day there would be one who came and he would change all of this. But the people, most of them, just believed that God had forgotten them. Some thought maybe he was angry. That's why they hadn't heard in so long. And some just thought maybe he just doesn't care anymore. Maybe, maybe we're not those people that we once were. So the people just kind of moved through their existence like detached ghosts. They were, they were trying to stay out of Rome's way. But on this night, on this night, it became evident that God was neither distant nor was he angry. In fact, this night begins to tell us a whole other story about God and his involvement with the world, that God is for us, that he's not against us. The, the announcement that, that the angels was making was what they were broadcasting this entrance of, of not just the one that had been promised, but this is the one that was going to change it for everybody. God's for us and not against us. See, God makes it very clear from the beginning who this baby was. And in this birth announcement, this announcement for the ages, he uses three titles. The angels tell us, born this day in the city of David is a savior, that's a title, and a role, who is Christ, that's a title and a role that he's going to play, and that he says, the Lord. So we have three titles, three roles that this baby is going to grow up and play. And the, these three roles are just as pertinent right now where we sit as they were that the, uh, the night that the shepherds heard what was about to happen. So we want to take a look at those. Let's look at the first one. There's a Savior who is Christ the Lord, the Savior. See, Jesus came as a Savior because we need a Savior. How many of you would agree with that? See, this is, not, this is not rocket science. Does everyone understand that Jesus would never have become the Savior if you did not need to be saved? This is a role he had to take on. This is a role he had to embrace because somebody had to do it. And quite frankly, folks, the whole universe is really short on honest-to-goodness goodness, honest goodness saviors. As God looked around, there was only one. Only one could fit the bill. Only one. See, the word that, that we draw from, the, the, word, uh, the, the verb to save uh, in the Greek, the word sozo, is, is a word that implies a number of things. One, that these are people who are in deep danger and there's no way of escape. But someone came in and 
made a way, brought them out and put them into a place of safety, out of danger, into safety, out of disturbance, into well-being. There had to be somebody who could transfer because we could not do it ourselves. There's implied in, in the words uh, in Sozo that, that somebody is sick, somebody is broken, somebody is just messed up, and there's not one thing we can do about it. We will stay sick, we will stay broken, we will stay messed up. And then along comes a Savior. And in the act of saving me, begins to change the brokenness, the stuff I broke, the choices I made, the stuff that other people broke for me. Anybody got any of that? Other people's decisions keeps me in work. You can think about that. People make bad decisions, and it leaves them in this place of desperation. But Jesus saw that, and he stepped into time. He stepped into life. He became one of us, Emmanuel, God with us, in order to deal with all of us and all of our brokenness. He came as a Savior because we needed a Savior. If you could have at any point done it yourself, he would never have had to come and play that role. If even one individual could have really pulled themselves up by their bootlaces and pulled themselves back, in, back up into this place of saving themselves, that if one could have done it, then the rest of us could have done it. But not one in history has ever been able to. So Jesus came on our behalf. Does everybody get that? There's one born in the city of David, and he's going to be a savior See, he not only saves us from something, he saves us to and for something. This is part of what the good news is about. What does he save us from? Well, let's, let's read this in, in um, uh, Ephesians 2. We start with verse 1. Because Paul is writing about this very thing, the role of Savior and what it means for you and for me. So verse 1 says, you were dead in trespasses and sins. So what does he save me from? Death. Death. You were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. He's talking about the devil. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We did what we wanted, and what did it get us? That's what he's saying. What did it get us? Death. That's the state God found us in, among whom we once lived the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were no different from anyone else. See, this, here's what Paul's saying. You're not in trouble with God. You are dead to him. You're not in the doghouse. You're in the morgue. Everybody got that? See, this is where he found me. There was no spark of life. God is the source of all life in this universe. He is the source of all light in this universe. And I didn't have a spark in me. There, there wasn't a flicker. I was dead to him. Jesus came and in his act of, sal uh, of Savior took me from where he found me, this place of separation and distance of trying to do it by myself. He stepped into it and he says, here, let me fix that for you. And in so doing, forgiving my sins, he became my Savior. He saved me from death. What did he save me to? Well, life, his life. Let's keep reading in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is pretty big. See, Jesus changed our position. The place that we were, where we were lost 
and it was dark and there was no hope. Doing our best that we knew how. Others might have even been trying to help us along in this thing, but there was no spark. There was nothing there that was eternal that was going to, to cause me to change. Jesus, in his act as Savior, brought me out of death and he brought me to life. He changed my position. I have a new citizenship. I have a new family. I have a new source. I have a new help. All of those things in the act of Jesus being Savior. What did he save me for? From to life. But what's the life for? Well, let's keep reading in Ephesians 2. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. It's like you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to take all of eternity to show you just how good I am. And how saved you really are. How saved from death, how saved to life, how saved in this life for the purposes of what? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. There it is, Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are called for his purpose. Isn't that nice to know? He didn't just pull me out of the pit and, and give me some new identity. He said, all right, now I'm going to instill you with the very work of eternity. You now get painted into the big picture that I've been trying to paint for this world all along. You have place. You have position. You have relationship. You have purpose. Because I live, you live also. As he was called into the world, so am I in this world. There's purpose because, because of who he is. See, the, the Gospels, Jesus' ministry and the Gospels have this bias towards action. It's not a bias towards doctrine. It's not a bias towards a belief system or dogma. The bias is the power to activate, to see the purposes of God actually activated in my life, walking with him from now on. I have purpose in this life. So something's going on, and it goes on as we, as we look into the next title, Christ we began to see how some of this worked. Now, that word Christ or Christos, as it is in the, in the Greek, um, does everyone understand that Christ is not Jesus' last name? <laughs> it's not just God being good so that Jesus had something to write in that blank that says, you know, last name as he's applying for college. I'm, I'm sure he would have gone to UNR if it had been around. Yeah. It, it's a title. It's telling us who it is. The angels use it. There is a Savior. He's going to do all the things we just talked about for you. But this Savior is the Christ. He's the, he's the anointed, the expected one. The, the word Christ means anointed one. The Christ or the anointed one was the person commissioned and approved to perform and accomplish the specific office or task. As God brought Jesus onto the scene, he was given a tremendous responsibility. He was dying for the sins of the world, but with him also came the kingdom of heaven. He said it over and over and over again that he brought something with us that he intended to lay into the lives of those who would follow him. But there was only one person who could do that. There was only one who could accomplish that. It, there was not another. He had to be the anointed one. And so what was he anointed for? Well, he was anointed for all the things that anointed ones have to be anointed for. See, as the anointed one, Jesus secured his position as prophet, priest, and the major role of king. So what's, what's happening? Well, in the Old Testament and into the New, the signal that someone was actually 
not, not just recognized for an office, but was being taken and put into that office. He, their, their responsibilities had changed. And now as the one on whom they had poured the sacred oil, they had poured the, the anointing oil over him, that that pers- person was now designated to play a role. And, and that role was very specific. And what we find in Scripture that, that sometimes there were prophets who were anointed, but they're always the priests and the kings were always anointed. And what they were saying was, now that that oil has been poured on you as a symbol of God's blessing and a symbol of God's choosing you to be that person in this framework, uh, you can now perform the tasks that are, that are specified for that job, for that role. The priest could offer the sacrifice. The, the priest could, could do all of the things assigned that he could do, but he couldn't do it before the anointing. The king to rule the people, couldn't just step in and say, I'm the king. He had to be selected and acknowledged and that symbol, that was it. The prophet, the same way, they had a job. And, and, and they were not to cross over each other. Remember the story of King Saul? He was anointed as king and he then tried to step into the role of what? Priest. He was going to offer that sacrifice in Samuel's place. He was going to take action because it didn't look like Samuel was going to arrive and he stepped out of his anointing and tried to step into another. The anointings were very specific. But with the Messiah, the Messiah was going to be different because he was going to be anointed as the prophet, as the priest, and as the king. And all three of those were going to hold significance for us. When he said, when the angel said that, that he, this, this one that's coming, the Savior, he's going to be Christ. They're not two different people. But this one who's going to come and save us for our sin is also going to be anointed for all the roles that need to be played that can connect us and keep us connected to God. You following me? Jesus was that one who became the connector, the conduit that would run all that was God and the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of heaven. Jesus would become the source and he would run that to us and we through him would be able to run everything back through Jesus to the Father. We had an open door. There now was a place to go. Now the problem was that the Hebrews, the Jews, had 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 this eschatological expectations of of the Messiah. They had expected him so long that they had begun rewriting the story. They they liked the parts where it looked like he was going to be, the Messiah was going to be the king and, and, and he was going to put Israel back on the map. They would no longer be this backwater of Rome, but like when King David was around, they would become this this ascendant nation. And they began to wrap their story, their gospel of the Messiah, in this nationalist wrapping. And they began to preach it as though though, uh, uh, this Messiah, when he came, only would have interest in them. But the angels, remember what the angels said? Remember in the announcement what they said? That this was going to be good news for who? All people. And they forgot that this this Messiah was too big to be held in a nationalistic place and a role for for that nation. This was a Messiah for all people. God had a bigger picture. God had, had uh, the Christ was coming, anointed for the task the, the, for, of serving all mankind. All nations would be blessed. The Christ, of course, the, the Hebrew version of that is what we call Messiah. It means the same thing, the anointed one. He said there will never be another, but all that ever needs to be taken care of, all that mankind are going to need are going to be found in the anointed one. He will fill all of the offices, and through him we can be connected to our Father forever. That's a pretty big announcement, don't you think? He is Savior, and he is Christ. But he's also what? The Lord. See, um, here's the one that begins to get us in trouble. If we think of him as Savior, does everyone understand there wasn't one thing you could do to make him the Savior? I mean, you could 
accept him as your own. You can make him your own savior. But Jesus came. That's a role he, he selected, came out of heaven onto the earth to play for us because we needed a savior. He came in the role of Messiah because we needed someone to play that, that connector, to be the anointed one of God, to bring the kingdom of heaven to us in order that we might live in it now and be taken to it when, when life is ended, the, the actual place of heaven. We needed that. Jesus came to, pl to play that role. But does everyone understand that Jesus was already Lord before he came? There will be a time when this earth does not exist anymore. It will be vapor. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. The old will have passed away. That's what the Bible teaches us. And at that point in time, we, Jesus won't have to be a Savior. That's, a, that's something he's doing for us now. That role will be played out and done. We won't need a Messiah. He has come once and for all to be the anointed one for us all, but that will be done. But does everybody understand that he was, he is, and he always will be King, Lord of all? And that's where we get in trouble, isn't it? Because the first two, he did them. Remember, there was not much I had to do about that. He came, he played those roles because we needed it. We accept him as our Savior and go on, isn't this wonderful? My sins are forgiven. And then the angels ruin it all by saying, oh, yeah, by the way, he's also the Lord. He has to be Lord. He has to be master. He has to be king. That word, um, the kurios in, in uh, Greek, is a really strong word that just says he's in charge. And if he's going to be Lord, he needs to be Lord in your life. He needs to be in charge of you. And it's at this point I have to start making decisions. Before, I just took the benefits. What, what a blessing, you know? But now, he says, I want to be Lord of your life. See, we call him Lord. There's this automatic recognition that something serious is going to be required of me. And then we call it submission. I have to bend. I have to bow. I have to recognize that he has rights because he paid for me with his blood, because he had plans for me from the beginning, because he is Lord. He gets to choose and not me. How many of you like having a Savior and having a Messiah? How many of you realize, though, he has to be Lord? He's got to be Lord. See, after the resurrection, here's something that began to happen. The title of Lord, as applied to Jesus, became more than a title of respect. It was a way of declaring Jesus' deity. They began to recognize that this king, this Lord, was God in fact. You remember that story where Jesus dies on the cross he, he raises the third day and he begins showing himself to his disciples. He comes right through locked doors, you know, kind of like my house when the wind is blowing. <laughs> Just a breeze in there. He comes, he comes through and, and all, of the, all of the disciples are they're, they're blown away except that Thomas was not there. I don't know what Thomas was doing, but he wasn't there. And when he gets back, they all say, Thomas, you should have been here. Jesus was here. He's alive. And Thomas said what? I can't believe it until I see it with my own eyes, until, until I see the hand, the holes in his hands and in his feet, and I stick my hand in the side where the spear went in. He said, then I'll believe it. And then Jesus shows up again, and Thomas is there. And all Thomas has to do is see him. And what does he say? My Lord and my God. It starts right there. It's this recognition that this one who has been my Savior, who has been my Messiah, is also my God, and there is no other. There will be no other. This is the one and only. And they declared it uh, on the day of Pentecost when Peter preaches that first sermon. He recognizes and points to the fact that this Jesus whom they crucified, remember him? As it turns out, he is Lord. That's what he says. He said, you messed up. 
big time. But we can fix this because this God who probably should wipe you and your memory off the face of the earth instead has opened the doors of grace and forgiveness and now in him you can have life. He offered it to him, it turned around um, and offered it, declared Jesus is Lord. See, in declaring that Jesus is Lord, we commit ourselves to follow and obey him. Luke 6, 46, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Jesus knew what the title meant. The angel stood and they said, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. That's good news. We got a Savior. Someone's got to get us out of this. Who is Christ? Oh, even better. Even better. All that f- can flow from the Father is going to flow. This is the same guy. There's not two different ones. The Savior is also the Messiah. And he says, and he is the Lord. He owns you your life will be better because he is a good a benevolent and an active God in your life but he will be God what does it say in Philippians 2 God exalted Jesus to the highest place gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus Every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That moment, folks, is coming. And every knee, no matter what your theology was, no matter what you thought your source of help was, no matter who you appointed as your Savior, as the culture that was going to get you out of this, no matter what, it says every eye will see and every, every single human being will take a knee and they will declare what? That Jesus is in fact the Lord. The problem will be that for many it will be the first time it escapes their lips and it will be too late. You got it? But it's not too late for you, and it's not too late for me. I'm hearing this story today that this one who was born, not as we'd love to keep him a baby in a manger, because, you know, I remember your kids when when you you brought them home and you could stick them in one place, come back 20 minutes later, they were, like, still in the same spot. (laughs) Remember how that worked? And my wife loved it, you know, when when we brought our son home, and she loved it because she could dress him up, and he didn't complain. (laughs) You know, buy him all kinds of cute little things. And he would wear them, you know, and not say a word. We love that picture of a baby in a manger because there's not a whole lot of threat there. But the angels were declaring something a little different, weren't they? This one is going to be that one. And he's going to be all three of these things for you because you need him to be all three. You need him as Savior. You need him as Messiah. And he will be forever the Lord. So I want to acknowledge him right now. All right, are you with me? Jesus, you are my Lord. You will be. Thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for being the Messiah, the source of of anointing, the source of life. But Jesus, I am so glad that because of those things, I now know you as King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the beginning. You are the end. The alpha and the omega. And you're everything in between. And there'll never be anybody replace you. There'll never be anyone subvert you. There'll never be anybody push you off that throne. Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And that, and that, my friends, is one heck of a baby announcement. Heavenly Father, thank you for those who may not know you as Savior today. Father, give them opportunity. That's the door in. Know you as Savior. To know my sins forgiven. What a gift. But to know that the one who did this for me is also the source, the connector to God, the flow from him to me. Lord, connect me. 
I want Jesus as my Messiah. But Lord, for it to grow, for it to have meaning, for it to have purpose, you need to be Lord. And Lord, today, I would make you that. Forgive me for doing this myself, my own way, my own prescription. Jesus, today, I make you Lord of my life. And tomorrow, Lord, I'm going to do it again. Bless these people, Father. We pray your people in Jesus' name. Amen.